and hello Sarah and hello everybody out there. Nice to see you back here again for another Irish influence. Mike, do you want to introduce Sarah there and we'll start moving? I will. Um, so Sarah is Sarah Townsend, um, PhD from Berkeley, uh, BA from Michigan, um, as classed as a scholar of modern and contemporary Irish fiction and drama with also work on 20 and 21st century British and Anglophone literature. I'm not actually going to talk about a research because in a way that's what we're going to talk about during the chat. So Sarah, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, with the first question. And one thing, just to remind everybody, um, if you've got questions for Sarah you want to, us to put to her, then type them into the Q&A button and we'll get to them during the evening. Um, so Sarah, you studied at Michigan when we were a first generation college student and then went to Berkeley for grad school. So where did you grow up and how did that journey to and through then college shape you? Yeah, so I grew up um, outside of Detroit in the suburbs. And uh, as a first col generation college student, I think like many others in my position, um, I, it was always assumed that I would go to college, but I was never quite sure what I was supposed to do with that experience. Uh, and it was in my first uh, semester as a college student, my freshman uh, roommate and now very dear friend, Lisa, uh, said to me, why don't we become English professors? And I said, that's, that's a fantastic idea. How do we do that? Uh, and she said, well, we go get PhDs. And I said, well, that's that. Let's, let's do it. And of course, I'm, like many things in life, the person who is masochistic enough to follow through with that plan. Um, but, you know, in, at Michigan, it was really um, the course I took with George Bornstein, who I'm very sorry to learn uh, just this week, passed away earlier this month. Um, but he taught uh, regularly a course on Joyce and Yates. And I enrolled in it mostly out of curiosity. There's just this sort of um, faint echo because I'm adopted into an Irish family. And that got me into the classroom. And from there, you know, like many people, I just fell in love with the material. That led me to study abroad for a summer in Dublin. And, you know, that, and that experience studying abroad is what kind of convinced me that maybe I could do this for a living or at least go to graduate school. I think for a lot of people who want to leave home um, but don't exactly have a model for how you do that, graduate school is one of those great levers to you know send you on to other places you want to explore. And you know, I don't think I could have done that quite in that way without having um, had that you know academic experience in undergrad. Graduate school in Berkeley, and um, just going back there. Actually, I'm so happy to hear that it was Joyce and Yates that led you into this, and then it was Dublin that confirmed that it was the right decision. Tell me a little bit about Berkeley, and I kind of know the place, as you know, despite my age and decrepitude. You and I almost, almost overlapped in our time in 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 Berkeley. Um, we overlapped by a year. Did we by by a yes. year? Wonderful, wonderful. That was all my good luck. So tell us something about your time in Berkeley and what brought you into Irish studies there. Not a university that's really terribly well known for its Irish studies as a, as a center. I mean, it is now because it has an Irish studies program, but at the time I went there, oh. it was pretty much the late and great John Bishop, the Joycean who Joe and I both worked with and um, who we lost last year, sadly. Um, but he was amazing. And you know, I went in with a hunch that I wanted to do Irish literature, but I was open to a lot of other ideas. and very quickly taking his modernism class and revisiting Yates and Joyce and a bunch of other modernists. I was very sort of set on this path. And over the years, there were a lot of people who tried to talk me out of it, um, probably mostly for well-meaning reasons. Um, the number of times I've heard there are no jobs in Irish studies, you have to do something else. Um, but I am a very stubborn person. And so I was determined to do it. And I think, you know, like, like people who go to programs that are not specifically designed to do Irish studies, um, it takes a lot of mentorship and it takes a lot of sort of chance encounters um, with other areas of Irish studies to make that happen. I mean, one of the early formative experiences was doing the Irish seminar that Notre Dame puts on every summer. And I mean, that, was, that gave me a kind of boot camp foundation in the kinds of things that I was learning, sort of um, picking up here and there, but hadn't done in a concerted way. Um, and so that was, that was a huge experience going to Irish studies conferences. Yeah. Um, and the other great thing we had at Berkeley, I don't know if it was um, around when you were there, is uh, the Fulbright Fellowship that uh, we would bring people in on. 
So during my time um, towards the latter end of my PhD, we had Emily Pine come out for oh. a year, um, who, who you both had on recently, and we had Moina Sullivan come out for a year. And you know that was a really good opportunity to uh, get mentorship from people in Irish studies who, you know, um, John was a wonderful mentor, but didn't really think of himself as an Irishist necessarily. And, you know, it was those kinds of opportunities that made it possible for someone who wasn't at a Boston College or a Notre Dame um, to do this and to sort of fit themselves into the field. It's marvelous. And the strength of Irish studies then and now is one of the issues that we'll come around to later because, of course, you play a central part in it now. Mike, do you want to? Ahead there. No, just kind of to go back in a way, I mean, that whole idea of kind of Ireland grabbing you in the study abroad and kind of embracing the culture of the seminar. I mean, was there anything intellectually competing with it? I mean, was, was there a moment where it could have been France or Germany or British literature? I mean, it, no, it, no, it, pre it pretty much lodged in my brain. And um, once I get an idea in my head, by damned, I'm going You're to You're going to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to what you're working on now. I mean, this is going to take some time. Um, you're working on a new project about the new Irish. Uh, and that's a term here in Ireland that's bandied around all the time in the media and has been really pretty much since 2004 or 5. Um, but in a way, just to sort of start explaining the project, what do you mean, what do you mean by that term? Because my sense when I read some of the stuff, you're using it slightly differently. Yeah, I am. I mean, maybe I should say first, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, what, how most people use that term. So since the 2000s, um, it's pretty much a kind of blanket term to describe mm -hmm. the new immigrants that were coming into Ireland during the Celtic Tiger years, starting in about the 90s. Um, and, you know, more specifically, I think it is a kind of blanket euphemism to say not white arrival, because of course people have been coming to Ireland for a long time, but typically they tended to come from the UK and, you know, from the US. And so I, I was really interested in that phenomenon um, as early as my dissertation and then my first book chapter, I mean, in my first book project, um, I was looking at these multicultural sequels that will, were coming out in the uh, Celtic Tiger era, where writers, and I think Roddy Doyle and B.C. Adagon are the most famous uh, people to do this, but there are others, um, were rewriting very famous either Irish or American uh, stories, but populating them with people of color. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, it really struck me that calling the new people the new Irish was less about an attitude to those new arrivals. Um, that, you know, in the term new Irish, I think the media and, you know, Irish culture sort of writ large was really making an argument for um, a kind of advancement that Ireland had undergone, that is a certain kind of first world status that you have when all of a sudden you have people coming to your shores and you have to figure out how to deal with them, how to integrate them and whatnot. Um, and so that idea had sort of been kicking around in my head for a while. And this project, la I landed into this project kind of serendipitously. Um, I was preparing a, an invited talk and I was going to talk about the housing market and you know, the crash in Ireland. And I, I don't know why, I just had this hunch that I wanted to at least say a little something about Detroit, both because it's where I'm from and because uh, there had been such a housing bust in Detroit that resembled very much what was going on in Dublin and other parts of Ireland. And so kind of on a whim, I, I you know, dove into all of the digital archives I could find. And what I came up with, I, I found this item and it's like one of those just, you know, amazing moments, you know, anyone who's done archival research knows that is like the, the golden egg you're looking for and you rarely find. And I printed it out because I love it. It also appears in um, my chapter uh, in the Rutledge Handbook of, International Handbook of Irish Studies, um, which uh, Mike co-edited with Brianna Crower and Renee Fox. Um, but this is it. It came from the uh, Detroit Free Press in 1949. 
And it is an article about the neighborhood of Corktown, which uh, was an Irish American enclave that formed in the 19th century. And this is written in the mid 20th century, um, you know, at the time that my mother and her siblings were growing up there. And it's talking about all these new immigrant groups that have more or less supplanted the Irish in that neighborhood. So a neighborhood that very much founded and modeled itself on an Irish sensibility was seeing a lot of Irish people sort of move out to other parts of the city and increasingly at this time to the suburbs. And so uh, Mexican immigrants, Maltese immigrants, and all these other groups were going into the neighborhood. And I think, you know, the neighborhood was really trying to reimagine what it was. But this piece sort of features a group of school children who are putting on this pageant and they called them the new Irish. Right. Uh, among other terms, you know, the new Corktowners, new kids of Corktown. And it immediately signaled to me that this was a kind of story that was not unique to 21st century Ireland. That this idea that there are different variations and different generations of Irish people um, was a very important part of the story of Irish American assimilation. And so from there, it just became a project where I said, I've got to find, there have to be other moments where people are either using the specific term, the new Irish, or this idea that there are sort of variations and, um, and gradations of Irishness in Irish American culture. And um, that's essentially what the project has become, a, a sort of longer history to both the term and this idea of, of racial succession, that you become whiter or you become sort of differently white um, over the course of your time as an immigrant population. I, I just okay. want to say that I, 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 I'm sorry that we didn't actually uh, arrange to pull up that photograph because there's a particularly dramatic one there of these four or five children, age maybe what, 12, 13 or so, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're coming from maybe uh, backgrounds that are from South American and a, a, a variety of, of, of ethnicities and all under the presiding statue of St. Patrick. There's something very, very gorgeous about it. And the assumption I think that you're suggesting in there is that the Irish were in some sense, perhaps congratulating themselves, patting themselves on the back for their ability and their willingness to absorb these people into the new Irish. And that's maybe the parallel that you're making. Is that right? Yeah, it is. And I mean, what's really interesting is I found very similar articles um, from Ireland in the 2000s that would feature, and you know, this, this phenomenon I've learned um, in journalism of doing some story on the Irish right around St. Patrick's Day every year. I mean, it just goes back and back and most of the things I've found in the newspaper archives usually happen in March. Um, but I've found, you know, similar features of, you know, five new Irish citizens in the 2000s who all talk around St. Patrick's Day about what it means to be Irish and why they really feel like they're Irish. And I mean, I think in this this piece and in those pieces, um, one of the implications is that um, these people want to be Irish. And, you know, there's a line in this article that says, you know, the Maltese brag that they're more Irish than the Mexicans because they got here first. And, you know, there's so many interesting things that are written out of immigrant experience in these narratives, but they're deploying that term and that idea that someone is succeeding them in really, I think, you know, um, leading ways. That's um, when you think about Ireland in recent years, I mean, obviously one of the numerically biggest groups is the Polish, followed by Latvian, um, Lithuanians. I mean, their whole kind of take on the new Irish and that sense of, in the media or wherever they're interviewed, saying, oh, we're Irish, that actually has a lot to do with a shared Catholicism, or at least a shared sense of a Catholic tradition. Does mm -hmm. that fly when you look in Detroit, elsewhere in the US? That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that connection, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of the immigrant groups that were coming into this neighborhood, um, you know, it's emphasized that they were going to the same church. They were in the same church pews that the Irish used to be in. And, you know, the center of um, Corktown in Detroit was Most Holy Trinity Parish. That was, the, you know, that defined the parameters of the neighborhood, but that was also the kind of cultural and social hub of the neighborhood. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of these articles talk about the fact that now mass are offered in you know multiple languages and all the all the priests speak Spanish and so when they have these sort of annual celebrations around St. Patrick's Day but also the feast day of, of the parish um, that you get people crowding into the churches that don't look like the the old inhabitants. Um, I hadn't thought of that specific connection but I think you're absolutely right Mike yeah. Because yeah, it applies with church services here that was a 
famous. I don't know whether it's famous because I noticed it or it was famous, but I, an article in the Irish Times maybe five, six years ago about the sort of empty churches, but clearly there was the one in the middle of the city centre which had the Polish priest, the service in Polish, and it's packed. And that whole idea before they moved the seminarians out of Maynooth and sent them to Rome, uh, I think the last seven, six of them again were Polish. That again, that kind of, you know, new Irish experience was shaped and at least mediated as sameness. Even if the Irish were leaving Catholicism, they still tick that box on the census. And I think that sameness is very important because again, I think you see it, I mean, Joe would know better than I would having lived there, but I mean, my sense is always you see it in South Boston, that while in places like Dorchester, you still have the big rows of Irish pubs, it's an Irish area, the Irish aren't living there anymore. Um, but that there's kind of, again, the kind of idea of the Hispanics who've taken their place are still speaking to the same ideas of Catholic schools, Catholic churches, and so on. And just as you bring that up, Mike, uh, just to remind people indeed that I'm, my suspicion is that while I would have thought that Detroit couldn't be further from Dublin, or further indeed, perhaps from the sense from Boston, is that the experience there may very well map onto the Boston experience. So uh, if any of the people in the audience there, if you have any questions or suggestions there, either through the chat or through the Q&A there, I'd be very happy to hear them and really very happy to put them to Sarah. Very particularly if you, if, if you, if you recognize parallels in your own ancestry, perhaps, uh, with what we're hearing about in Detroit, and the move from one type of Irish, am I hearing the right, Sarah, from who might have been the less curtain Irish to the new Irish? Wh when did that divide happen? When did the first immigrants begin to be thought of as being the new Irish? And that distinguished them from, how old were the old Irish? Can I just get a little bit of chronology here, if you don't yeah. mind? Yeah, well, it was really interesting as I got into the project, I realized that new Irishness is used in two very contradictory ways. Hmm. I mean, sometimes it describes the people who come and supplant you. And so like in mid-century Detroit, um, the idea is that people have moved out to the suburbs. And so their hold on Irishness has almost bleached out into a, a blanket American whiteness. Um, whereas the people who are supplanting them, they call them the new Irish in a way to kind of preserve the idea of the urban ethnic enclave, even though it's disappearing. And, you know, as, as my chapter on that um, particular episode shows, um, you know, urban renewal projects, as soon as the Irish sort of moved out of the area and people of color moved in, um, mm -hmm. urban renewal projects came and kind of carved up all of those neighborhoods, especially black neighborhoods, um, but Corktown too, um, to, you know, build freeways and, and, you know, revitalize the city and whatnot. Um, so in that case, you know, um, new Irishness is a marker of, you know, becoming, you might say, lace curtain Irish because, um, because you've moved on and someone else has taken your place. But there are these other moments in the project and, and in the history where um, the term new Irish is actually used again to mark a difference from a previous generation of Irish people. So the late 19th and early 20th century, um, right when you know federal immigration policy is beginning to take shape and become more restrictionist, um, you have Irish people who have been coming over for a very long time in very high numbers, especially Irish women, suddenly having to make a new case for the, uh, the reason why they deserved Irish citizenship, mm -hmm. uh, American citizenship. And so, you know, in the time they start using this idea of the new Irish to distinguish themselves from, you know, what was certainly not the only body of immigrants who came in the 19th century, mm -hmm. but in the public imagination, Irish immigrants were poor, they were fleeing famine, they had very little in their pockets. And, you know, you see this both in journalism and you see this um, in public policy documents in sort of um, economic society documents and in some of the papers of the Ellis Island commissioners talking about, well, these are not the same Irish that used to come. These people are very, you know, articulate. These people are very professionally advanced and these people are going to make their way in Irish society. And so I, I, that's part of what really interested me about this project is that the same term could be used in these completely opposite ways, um, but both times it's really marking a body of immigrants as whiter than their predecessors and somehow more deserving to stay than, you know, other people they're distinguishing themselves against. That's and the whole idea of kind of, you just use terms as whiter than others. Mm. I'm not sure if the kind of the whiteness debate has been bouncing around since the 90s. Um, what, what are you doing with whiteness, as it were? I mean, where, where does this fit into 
uh, debates around the new Irish. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, yeah, uh, like you were saying, whiteness studies really became very popular in the 1990s. There was a whole host of um, books that kind of came out at the same time, mostly by labor historians. Um, who were trying to sort of figure out what the relationship was between the working class and this idea of, in particular, ethnic whiteness. These people who came to the United States and somehow through labor unions and other mechanisms, you know, became accepted as part of the white majority. Um, uh, Noel Gnatchev's uh, How the Irish Became White is probably, you know, the most familiar to people who study Ireland, um, but there were a bunch of them at the time. And I think, you know, that laid a really interesting foundation, but it also received a lot of criticism in, in academic circles. Um, and one reason was because it leaned really heavily on this notion of whiteness without always differentiating all the different gradations of whiteness that actually existed in the United States. And so since then, I think, you know, scholars have done a lot of work to kind of nuance um, both Irish whiteness and white and ethnic whiteness more broadly. And so like in Irish studies, um, Peter O'Neill, uh, Catherine Egan, uh, Diane Negra, Amy Kluke, there have been a bunch of people who have really been looking at the way that um, Irishness as an identity um, is in part a production of whiteness, but it also leans really heavily on blackness in many, you know, um, counterintuitive ways. And so, you know, I think that's one turn that's happened in Irish studies that I've been really excited by and that I'm trying to sort of complicate as well, to note that there are so many versions of whiteness and whiteness is not something you sort of achieve in the 19th century. The, the early versions of whiteness studies really sort of argued that the Irish became white by the end of the 19th century and, you know, it was a one and done phenomenon. And, you know, as my project, it keeps showing me um, the terms of whiteness are constantly being reproduced because the, um, the political terrain keeps changing, you know? So in the late 1980s, for instance, the Irish, uh, there are, there's a sizable population of undocumented Irish in the United States and the Irish American community is pushing very hard to have um, various kinds of amnesty programs or paths mm -hmm. to legalization. And suddenly that sort of blanket, unmarked whiteness no longer serves their purposes. In fact, it, it's very much in their favor to highlight the fact that many Irish are still emig are immigrating uh, to the United States. And um, you see this really interesting process in some of the congressional debates of the era, where the Irish early on were sort of making these really problematic claims that they were being reverse discriminated against. Um, by the 1965 Hart Seller Act, where which did away with the national origins system and basically repaired a very racist system from which people like the Irish had benefited. And very early on in those discussions, in like 1969, there are some hearings, and they're you know basically saying that this is um, there used to be a Chinese Exclusion Act, now there's an Irish Exclusion Act, mm -hmm. um, claims like that. And by the 80s, you see these advocates, these immigration advocates, kind of get savvy to the way that they have to produce immigrant whiteness. Mm -hmm. And so, on the one hand, you know, there's a lot of media coverage by. Um, the Irish immigration reform movement and other sort of parties who are championing these people as, you know, articulate and they all speak English and they all have college degrees, which was not true, but this is, you know, part of the, the front facing campaign is that they're very white. And on the other hand, they're um, building these coalitions with Asian American and Latinx organizations who are all pushing for more immigration um, and greater immigration numbers. And that's a really interesting instance where the Irish need to produce a very different version of whiteness than has served them in the past. Um, and, and so I, I think that's really interesting. And the other thing about whiteness studies is that um, it really needs to be brought into the 20th century and people are doing that. And I hope this project can be a small piece of bringing it uh, into the 20th and maybe even the 21st century. Can I go back just a second there to, to, to that book that you mentioned, of course, because I suspect that for many people out there who aren't in the academy, that their only understanding or their introduction to this would have been a book that was sold very, very widely and even very, very famous, How the Irish Became White. And I, I wonder if you could speculate, on why was that taken to the hearts, taken to the bosom of so many Irish people? Why was that so popular? Why was that so loved? 
if you're telling me, in fact, that, that, that it's something that the whole thesis is one that's, that's been essentially discarded by people who know better. Is, is, am, I, am I hearing you properly? It, it's been refined. I mean, it's a really influential book. I think, you know, I was, I'm actually part of a reading group that just discussed this this week. Wow. And I mean, it is a, such a clever title. Mm. I think it's a title that sort of gave a description to that sense of buried ethnicity that a lot of Irish Americans feel, but don't actually see operating in their everyday lives. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also been resurrected in much more problematic ways as people have been turning to Irish culture and Irish immigration experience um, for, you know, to argue that, you know, if the Irish could do it, certainly anyone else can do it too. And so I think, you know, in both, both directions, it's been a really influential piece because it lays forward a really compelling, although, you know, as it's been shown, kind of problematic argument that the Irish weren't considered white upon arrival. I mean, scholars have definitely sort of sensed that, well, legally, they were absolutely white upon arrival, as were other European immigrants, you know, um, if you compare them to what Black Americans could do, there, there's no question about their whiteness. Um, but that, that the terms of those white, that whiteness had to be earned. And um, I mean, didn't Clinton, I feel like Clinton sort of cited it and used it at one point. And so, it, you know, it's, it's a book that I think in many ways uh, was catapulted and also is still kind of hampered by its very, very clever and catchy title. Absolutely. Um, and I think there's, you know, it actually describes something. The other thing I've learned, um, so I read it very early on in my studies and then I recently came back to it and reread it, is um, I think I and a lot of people, if you haven't read it recently, misread it. Um, I think it's a lot more, it's, it's conflicted at various points. I think it contradicts itself, but it's a lot more subtle of an argument than the Irish weren't white and then they became white. And so, you know, in many ways it, it could, it could, um, it would benefit from a sort of renaissance of reading it. Wonderful, wonderful. Not to be said for catchy titles. I know. <laughs> Isn't one of the problems with that book and the, the debate that flows from it in some ways the actual Irish American perception of themselves that you're talking about a community which is multi generational, which going back to the Detroit case, post Second World War, suburbanizes and assimilates in a way they just hadn't before. And the Irish Americans lock themselves into this success narrative, which is, you know, we we had to become white. We did that at the end of the nineteenth century in that key cutoff date. Uh, and then during the 20th century, look at us in, in our nice veranda houses doing very well in the suburbs. And I think, isn't, isn't that the problem with the point you're making where this debate doesn't stretch into the sort of neck end of the 20th century, where you have the kind of tens, if not hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of the undocumented Irish who arrive in the US who don't find their way, don't find their green cards, are living you know, even if they're settled, they're living very peripheral legal lives. Is the problem with that group, which is why they have to be rethought in the way you are, is because the dominant narrative of the Irish heritage story is, oh, we succeeded. And those two things start clashing. Yeah, and I mean, that gen so that generation of the new Irish who called themselves the new Irish in the 80s um, kind of troubled that narrative in a few ways. I mean, one is that um, they, they've described, them, many of them have described themselves as a commuter generation. And so it's not the same pattern of sort of coming to the United States and settling there permanently. In fact, it was a generation of people who um, knew that they were very well educated, knew that they had a lot of professional mobility. And, you know, the thinking was that they would come to the United States for a number of years, um, get some kind of professional success, and then move back. And of course, there were, you know, many sort of unskilled and, you know, low skilled people who came and um, were very much living in the shadows and, you know, subject to all kinds of problems, especially as immigration reform started happening and, you know, employers were disincentivized by hiring people like the undocumented Irish. And I think that's so much of that, yeah, that media campaign. And I mean, we still see these pieces, especially, you know, after Trump's election, um, I started seeing these articles all over again saying, you wouldn't believe it. 
but there are white Irish people in the United States who are undocumented. And, you know, um, uh, you know, naturalization services are, are coming to get them as well. INS is after them as well. And, you know, it, it, it had a, that problematic tone of exceptionalism because, of course, you know, we take a deep interest in people's immigration woes um, when they look more like us or when they surprise us in, um, in, the, in those kinds of ways. Uh, we're getting a number of questions in here, but even before we go to those, actually, I just want to turn to your position now. Um, we, we mentioned that you were the founder of uh, an Irish studies program in the University of New Mexico. Maybe that's not as unlikely as it seems to me. Um, am I, am I ent entirely wrong there? Or do you want to tell us something about that, about your arrival in New Mexico and the setting up of that program and, and, and what yeah. that tells us about, about where the Irish are now and where Irish yeah. studies is now and maybe even where it might be? I mean, you know, one thing it tells you is that my uh, co-creator, Caleb Richardson, the great historian, and I um, are a little bit nuts. I mean, we, we saw nothing contradictory at all in doing this, and it was only in the process of setting this up and having people repeatedly say, New Mexico, huh? You'd never think it. What a strange idea. And we realized that maybe there was something unusual here. Um, you know, I... So it's a small program. Um, I think a lot of the impetus for it was actually built before I was hired. Um, Caleb had been teaching here for a while and had been wanting to build something like this. And my line was um, sort of donor generated so that they could hire someone and build a program. Um, so we, you know, we started launching our program the first year that I was here. But I think the thing that I've come to realize is there's nowhere that's a kind of a place where you shouldn't build an Irish studies program. I mean, you know, there are, there's this natural assumption that people gravitate to Irish studies because they're of Irish heritage. And so in Boston, you build an Irish studies program, right? Um, or, you know, other places that seem to attract a lot of Irish people for, you know, a variety of reasons, like Notre Dame. Of course, you build an Irish studies program there because you'll have people um, who want to come to it. And I think even, you know, there are a number of parties um, at my institution that raise their eyebrows and say, why on earth would we want an Irish studies program here in the Southwest when, you know, there's lack of funding across the board and, and we could be doing other things. And the thing I found is that people want it. You know, our study abroad program, people come to it, our classes are packed, you know, our events are packed. And there are lots of sort of counterintuitive ways to get into Irish studies. In fact, in many ways, it's probably the future of the field. There are only so many enclaves where you have, you know, outside of Ireland, where you have a sort of natural population of people who want to study Ireland for a very particular reason. Mm -hmm. But here in the Southwest, I mean, border politics, mm -hmm. uh, race relations, uh, the history of imperialism, these are things that automatically make sense to our students. So I remember my first, first year- Exceptionalism actually, it can be turned into a universalism there, if, I, if I'm hearing you properly. Yeah, and I mean, I imagine so many other places that would lend just completely counterintuitive, but really refreshing sort of perspectives on Irish studies. I think we've gotten very used to a very particular version of it, the kind of, the version that I'm familiar with and that I came up through, you know, history and literature um, are the predominant disciplines and they, they you know, um, yeah. gather in major urban centers, usually with a lot of Irish people. Um, and I think there are other people who are doing this work who have proven that, um, you can go to counterintuitive places and um, do different work and, you know, um, hopefully refreshing work. Right. And may I just say, actually, there, um, before we turn to some of the questions, indeed, is that as we talk about the, the, the future of Irish studies, as you say, we have been categorized. I mean, we seem to have been emerging out of English and history at what, is what it was. But indeed, if, we are, if we're thinking about the Irish influence upon the world at large, the global influence, part, then maybe we should be thinking about things like the obvious one is music. The influence of Irish music, I mean, throughout, uh, not just Irish music itself, but indeed the way that it's affected rock music and the music that young people are listening to. So there, so there are areas that maybe we haven't paid enough attention to that might open up in the future. Yeah, I mean, there are a ton of areas. Um, and I think, you know, part of it's just habit and the networks that we have. I mean, I put together something a couple of years ago and my co-organizers and I kept racking our brains. We're like, okay, sociologists political scientists. And, you know, we, we kept having trouble coming up with them simply because of the, you know, sort of limitations of our inbuilt networks. Um, but there's so much interesting work in music, um, in sociology, in poli-sci, 
um, there are lots of corners of the university that we haven't even thought about as um, ripe for Irish studies. And does Irish studies actually necessarily mean you have to study Ireland or the Irish diaspora? Because a lot of people who have been building programs have taught me, and, and I've started to see it, that if you take students who are interested in things that seem to have nothing to do with Ireland and send them to Ireland for you know, an internship or a scholarship year, um, that that too is a form of Irish studies. And in fact, a kind of a form that creates inroads that we don't already have. Okay. I, um, I stumbled upon the most interesting article um, that has nothing to do with my research and just the way that you do sometimes. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the scholar. She teaches in New York somewhere, um, but it was from an archeologist who had done this dig in a neighborhood in New York and discovered that Irish Americans in the 19th century drank much more soda water than your average Americans. And sort of went on to theorize what that was about. And as someone who drinks too much soda water, I was fascinated. But, you know, I was thinking, why don't we have, you know, archeologists at our conferences and wouldn't it be great if we did? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the field could open up in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, one way to do that might be this really counterintuitive programming. I suspect that the whole audience, like me at this moment, are just silently trying to theorize what could it possibly be that had the Irish of the last century drinking yeah. soda water? Uh, I actually, was I do about holy wells. <laughs> I can uh, stereotype now. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Um, yes. Alenia Brown, are the Irish unique among whites in wanting to claim others as new Irish? I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, actually, no, I do know, I do know in part the answer. Um, not in America, but actually overseas. So um, I was in a fellowship last year at Wellesley and one of my um, other fellows um, is from Italy. She's Eritrean um, Italian. And she uh, told me that that term new Italians is in use in Italy in very much the same way that it's in use in Ireland. Um, and then another fellow who is from Korea told me that uh, New Koreans is similarly used in Korea to talk about people who are coming into Korea who look a little bit different. Um, I'm not sure if other groups in the US, I think it'd be really interesting to look, look at, um, use that same terminology, but certainly it's being used in countries um, across the world that are seeing new populations come in. And, 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 and I don't know enough about this. I don't know anything about these things at all. But there is, of course, that famous phrase, more Irish than the Irish themselves. And that was something that I think was played out towards the end of the 19th century. And I mean, coming out of some kind of an Arnoldian argument that we were the element that absorbed, that the Irish race or the Irish culture was powerful enough that those who came in would become part of us and willingly and desire to become part of us. Maybe. Yes, and can I share a really great, um, Kelly Matthews taught me this last year, I gave a talk at uh, Framingham Univers State University, and she taught me this term, um, FBI, foreign born Irish, and apparently it's a term used in Boston <laughs> to describe people who, whose Irish needs, needs to be qualified apparently because they were born on the island of Ireland, and um, that to me is just absolutely fascinating. I suppose it's like with St. Patrick's Day, the famous badge that everybody wears, you know, um, mm -hmm. today I'm Irish or whatever the language is. But I mean, it's the idea that, you know, it's a it's a performative day where the Irish invite everybody in to be like them. I mean, it, it does work, if you say, on kind of multiple layers. Just another question from uh, Marjorie Howes. I'm fascinated by the wide range of sources you've been mining for this work. And I'm wondering if these terms slash issues appear in many literary texts or if the most fruitful sources, journalism, congressional debates, and other not so literary sources? Thank you for that question, Marjorie. Um, if you have suggestions, or if anyone has suggestions, <laughs> I'd love to hear them. I, um, I started this program, this project, envisioning that would be a little bit historical and archival and very literary based because, you know, that's my training and it's what I know best. And the further I've got in, into it, um, I find the most interesting stuff in, in places that I'm not accustomed to looking at. So at city planning documents, at, you know, city council meetings, um, at, you know, uh, the proceedings of the American Economic Society in the early 20th century, um, and in a lot of journalism. And so that's where I've been kind of hunkering down because, A, it's just so fascinating to me. Um, it's something so outside of my usual um, academic orbit. Um, but 
also because I haven't found it a lot in um, in literary texts, and I think that's also kind of um, my lack of familiarity with Irish American literature. I mean, I was very much trained within Irish Irish literature. Um, it's what I've known, and so. Um, if there are a whole host of Irish American literary texts that I should know about and think about for this project, um, please send them my way. I love hearing. One of the great things about um, sharing this work is I get to hear all these great suggestions, not only for literary texts, but also um, I hear from people in other cities who either grew up there or have family there um, that have experienced the same kinds of waves of transformation and succession, um, but at different times and in different ways. I've heard from people in San Francisco, New York, and uh, St. Louis and things like that. And so I like to hear those stories as well. And indeed, we get some kind of a story like that, actually, from Catherine Egan. Thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, referring to San Francisco itself, a city that I know and that you know, of course, terribly well, Sarah. The Mission Irish was the phrase that was used, supplanted then by Latinos. Mm -hmm. And Mission Dolores, that very, very beautiful old church there, and other small Catholic churches being the churches. Uh, Mission High, half Hispanic indeed. Thanks very much, Catherine. But can I just go a little bit further with that, uh, Sarah, as we're talking about cities and inner cities and the way they've been transformed, your work was done, of course, in Detroit, but you also speak about what's happening in Dublin at the moment and the new Irish that are new now and that, that, that the shifts as, as one category is moved aside. Do you want to say something about how you see parallels, if that's the word, or echoes perhaps, as are happening in Dublin now with what we now call the new Irish? Yeah. I mean, actually, I would ask both of you if the term is as prevalent um, as it sounds like you're suggesting it is. I feel like I've seen it less and less in recent years, mostly as you know, second generation people have come up and um, people have sort of reinserted specificity into their identity. And you know, I hear much more about say Nigerian Irish people mm -hmm. than about the sort of blanket new Irish. Um, but you're on the ground there. Is, is that the case or is this term still really used widely though? I think it, I mean, my impression is it, it refers back to what you were just saying in the sense of Marjorie's question of, Sources, etc. And my question is, my point would be in the last few years, it's become very much a media-driven term. It's still mm -hmm. there, um, mm -hmm. but it's a term that also, at one level, it does the things you're talking about. At one level, it's, it's a welcoming term, where people proclaim, I am the new Irish, I have my citizenship. It's also a deeply racist term in the way it's used mm -hmm. around issues around housing, social welfare, etc., etc. Um, but my, my guesstimate is it's, it's less apparent. I mean, maybe that's just a year of pandemic. There's nothing else in the news. Um, mm. But I think it's also, it's also the interesting thing now that, you know, since uh, EU enlargement 2004, I mean, we're 16 years on. I mean, those, those kind of young Polish couples who arrived have now got the kids in high school. You know, that, that whole sub level of assimilation mix against suburbanization, et cetera, that process has been going on now. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of what, again, what that term means when your kids are born in Ireland and are Irish and consider themselves Irish, mm -hmm. I think it does start twisting it in a way it did with the Irish American experience. Mm -hmm. yeah, really so that, 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 that reshaping of the definition of Irishness, um, at, at, whether it's over there or over here, whether it's those coming in or those going out, is, is, is something that's referred to by Kimberly, Kimberly DaCosta, uh, saying, as a black Irish woman from Boston, the expansion of the definition of Irishness, she says, is fascinating, and indeed it is. And also, she points out, perhaps long over to you, thanks very much. Much, as, as, as Kimberly points out, thank you. Much to uncover here, and many, many stories to hear. Really great. And I know that's a big part of the work that you do, Sarah, Sarah is actually in the uncovering of stories. And that's one of the marvellous things of, of the research that this is all about, I think, the individual tales. Um, can I just ask something about just your own individual tale and your own passport? You're an Irish passport holder, an American passport holder. When, when did that happen now? That happened, um, that happened after the 2016 election. Yeah. Um, something that I've been thinking about doing for a long time, you know, as someone who has more than one grandparent born in Ireland, I am, for better or for worse, uh, eligible for Irish citizenship. And, you know, I, I, I decided to act on it in a kind of reactionary post-election moment. Um, but it, it's, it's something that I've been thinking through. I mean, in all my course syllabi, I've been sort of closing my syllabi by saying, you know, the person who's going to teach you this Irish studies stuff is, you know, a Korean American Irish dual citizen who has no idea what that means. And 
You know, I mean, I learned a lot of things through the process. I mean, on the one hand, it is enormously cheap and easy and quick for um, second or third generation Irish people who've never set a foot in Ireland to become an Irish citizen. Um, ridiculously so when you think about how much money and how many hoops there are to become a US citizen, or how, you know, they're, um, how, how difficult it is for some people to become Irish citizens who are not of Irish ancestry after the 2004 citizenship referendum. Um, you know, Ronit Lenton has written really really compellingly about that double standard, um, mm. that there is a, um, a preference for what is assumed to be Irish and white Irish blood um, over the kind of um, uh, birthright citizenship that, you know, for a long time really um, defined how Irishness um, was granted. And, you know, I, I, I recognize the enormous privilege of someone who is, you know, started life in a Korean orphanage to be given not one, but two of the most coveted forms of citizenship in the world. And as a scholar, you know, that double standard um, is abhorrent to me. Um, I think, you know, but I, I take a kind of perverse pleasure in holding this passport under sort of very racist assumptions that I am white and of passing that citizenship on to my young child who is also very not, but very much not white. And, you know, increasingly, I think people who claim citizenship in this way will start looking a little bit different. I'll be really curious to see um, if that's a policy that Ireland keeps Very privileging or not. And that's, I mean, that's, that's interesting. It just goes back to the earlier question we were talking about the new Irish. I mean, obviously, the one group that have been left out of that positive version of new Irish here, uh, the people who can't get the passport, can't get the citizenship, are the people in direct provision. Um, who, you know, their aspiration is they want to be the new Irish. It's a reason they've come here uh, and yet are blocked and then locked into the system for years. I mean, and the issue there is that, again, becomes a non-white question because most of the people, if not uniformly, all of the people in direct provision are non-white. I mean, how, where does that fit into these definitions and debates? I mean, I think it's absolutely central to the um, the kind of imagining that went into that Celtic Tiger era new Irishness, which was um, this is a very unmarked territory that has people of color in it. We don't know how to lump them together. We don't know really what to do with them. And at least societally, we want to proclaim that we're a very integrationist and welcoming society. So we'll grant them the privilege of having a modified kind of Irishness. Certainly they're, they're not Irish Irish, they're new Irish. Um, but there's, there's, so many, there's so many slippages in that term itself. And you know, as I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm curious to know if the Eastern European, the EU, um, so, so-called new Irish people who have come and now, you know, 20 years on, um, I'm wondering if they are being perceived much more as white as I would expect, you know, in this time frame. Whereas, you know, the people of color who are, you know, as foreign as perhaps Eastern Europeans coming in um, are marked in very particular ways and, you know, are, are locked into this absolutely horrific um, ongoing system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're right about the kind of the Eastern European population. I mean, you did get all those stereotypes, not the one we talked about earlier, the Catholic question, um, mm -hmm. but the one that did the rounds 2008-9, oh, Poles have the same sense of humour. Oh, really? Drinking. Yeah, you know, all these stereotypes started coming out that kind of, you mm -hmm. know, a former Eastern European uh, migrants were kind of held close because, well, they were white, but then they were given, again, all these attributes that they were the new Irish, I mean, directly. Just one thing to move on. Um, a debate this week that's kind of been doing the rounds on Twitter here is one of the universities uh, here in Ireland has started, and this does feed into the Irish studies question about how you kind of um, make it more relevant, how you move it forward. But one of the Irish universities started a course called Writing Black. Um, the problem with that was that although the uh, course outline talked about understanding the black experience, the actual person who was teaching it was a white male. Uh, and in the department we're talking about in this particular university, there are, it's, it's an all white department. And somebody criticist, criticized it and said that basically that this department was performing allyship. It wasn't really offering any movement to change. 
how do you see that with Irish studies? How does Irish studies move forward into these new areas, into a much more uh, a challenging, dislodging power and privilege from the academy without doing what is called performative allyship? Yeah. I mean, Irish studies is in a, a, a tricky position because of course, on the one hand, it doesn't want to, it shouldn't have to apologize for its whiteness. But I think, you know, in the, the era of self-reckoning that institutions across the board are undergoing, um, it's, it's digging hard to try to figure out how to you know, sort of both support the, the new Irish communities that are in Ireland and diversify the field um, in ways that, you know, aren't, aren't tokenistic or performative, exactly. Um, I mean, my, my sense is always that um, you have to put your money where your mouth is. You know, if you want diversity, you have to ante up. And, you know, that takes a lot of different forms. But, um, you know, Irish studies is, is very welcoming. It has been to me, and, and as I've seen, you know, to the, the few scholars of color who, um, who have participated in it with the exception of a certain individual who I will not name who used to greet me at Irish studies conferences in Japanese every time he saw me. Um, loved that one. Um, aside from that, though, it's a very welcoming field, but as we know, you know, um, racism and inequality is usually addressed at the institutional level, the systematic level, and so, I mean, you know, in an ideal world, what does it look like? It looks like, you know, hiring uh, faculty of color, hiring faculty of color into, you know, teaching positions, hiring them into program directing positions, um, but of course, we're in an era where it's hard to hire much of anyone at most institutions, well-funded ones included. Um, I think, you know, other ways they can do it sort of are to, um, to really invest in undergrads. I think that's a way that we can diversify the field um, without or maybe alongside hiring more faculty of color who will attract uh, students of color is to go to different kinds of institutions that we're used to going to. Um, you know, program, and this is something Ellen Scheibel actually talks about a lot. She's got a lot of thoughts on this, but, um, you know, undergraduate institutions that are not the quote unquote elite institutions have all kinds of students who are capable of going into Irish studies and maybe entering the professoriate and being part of the academy, um, but we have to catch them early. We have to mentor them well. We have to support people who are creating those kinds of programs, and then we have to allow them into our graduate programs. You know, um, we're used to having graduate admits. I know my university, many places that come from a certain tier of university, and going outside of that will actually attract the kind of student, you know, the kind of students who are um, who are going to make the the field look different. Um, and and the other thing, I mean. The thing that I worried about when I started um, setting up an Irish studies program is it feels tricky to create something in Irish studies that gets a lot of um, donor interest and institutional interest um, at a time when there were so many budget cuts and programs, especially minority serving programs, you know, are, are getting the axe. You don't want it to be a zero sum game. And I think there are lots of ways that like Irish studies can spread the wealth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad there's funding for Irish studies because in a time, I'm pragmatic. If, in a time where there's no money, any money coming in is good, but there are ways that it can sort of share through joint appointments, through scholarships, things like that. Um, you know, the wealth with students who don't necessarily gravitate to and then immediately sort of rise to the ranks of Irish studies. I, there's a question here, uh, Sarah, and I'm going to read it out, but I don't for a moment expect that you're going to give an answer to it. I just to say is that's almost the underlying question of everything we're speaking about. And anonymous attendee asked just what is an Irishman <laughs> slash person. What's just what is an Irishman person? Is it one born in Ireland? Whenever that occurred of Celtic ancestry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can put a half a dozen more etc. after that. And I think that question was asked, if I remember, by McMorrish and Henry V. Isn't that right, indeed? And yep. asked yet again of our own great friend Leopold Bloom a little bit later. And over all those hot, how many hundreds of years, nobody was able to come to an answer, and I don't suppose that we can either. But do you want to say something about about the question rather than maybe the answer? If you want to, yeah, tell I mean, I think the answer is just about anyone. You know, anyone who um, feels a kinship, or anyone who comes into contact with someone else who thinks that um, there is something in them that looks similar to to Irishness. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, for a long time, we've known that some, many of the markers, the most salient markers that we think are so Irish, were either invented or refurbished you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century, and then also you know, sort of invented and refurbished in you know, the diaspora, like, like St. Patrick's Day, which has come around to be you know, a very big part of the Dublin scene. Um, you had the, the director of the St. Patrick's Day Festival, and I think earlier this year, um, but, you know, certainly is not one of those time-honored sort of Irish traditions. And so I think once you start peeling back the layers, you know, nothing is Irish and everything is Irish. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Another question. Um, this is from uh, Savita Nair. I have a new project on a social history of Indians in Ireland. They arrive from England or directly from India. My question what are your perspectives on a community who were not white, but unlike West Africans, for example, also not Christian? South Asians are not participating in the Catholic community. The exception maybe is a smaller community of South Indian Catholic nurses and their families. So how do we classify that? How do we class, sorry, can you, can you? So the question is, is, is what are your perspectives on a community who are not white? but unlike West Africans, for example, also not Christian. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, I, that's fascinating. I want to read, um, who is that? Sorry, I recognize the name. It's Sabita Nair, N -A yes. yes, I can't read to, wait to read um, Savita's work. Um, I've been reading a little bit more about how the Irish became white in, um, in the imperial sort of project. Um, so in India, how the Irish sort of performed their whiteness. Um, I'm not sure what to say about the reverse of that, um, except to say that's really, really interesting. I mean, um, I've done a little bit work on um, Muslim women in Ireland. And, you know, similarly, there, I think there's the, the sort of double stigma. A, you're not white, and B, you practice a religion that doesn't look like ours. And in the public lexicon, you know, um, multiculturalism or multi multiracialism is talked about a lot. And at least I don't hear a lot about sort of multi-faith efforts. Um, so I, I imagine that maybe some of those same challenges um, pertain, but, but I'm not sure, and I, I, I wanna learn more. And we've got a number of points from people actually are telling uh, little stories that they know about that I find absolutely fascinating indeed. Uh, Martha, thanks very much, pointing out in Quincy, Massachusetts, she says, there are many Irish who came to work in the granite quarries in the mid late uh, 1800s. The legend, she tells, is that the Adams family, descendants of John and John Quincy, decided at the turn of the century to move to Lincoln because of uncontrolled growth. In other words, the Irish. So there's the euphemism of the day. The legend continues that when members of the Adams family became Democrats at about that time, all the Irish became Republicans. There was a history of Irish Republican mayors in Quincy during this 20th century. Fascinating. And it's always a great pleasure, actually, when the kind of conversation we have here uh, introduce and bring up some memories or some little stories of which we're not aware um, from, from people out there. And Michael Collier, thanks, nice to see you here again, Michael, actually. Guess he wonders actually where I first met traditional Irish music. He lived in Los Alamos and oh, borrowed, yeah. ridiculously, it seems to me, and borrowed Seamus Ennis's 40 years of Irish piping from the Mesa Public Library there, and that was in 1981. So here we are talking about Irish stories in the most unlikely place. A lovely yeah. story. Thank you very, very much for that. Yes. It's also the one there as, um, from Madison Cortez, who's a PhD student uh, with Rob Savage in BC, um, who fits perfectly into your idea of um, new ways of doing things. She's writing a dissertation on identity formation in New Mexico and Northern Ireland, identities, borders, etc., etc. So it's I want to there. I want to talk to that person. That sounds absolutely fascinating, and um, I've got lots of ideas. If if um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear who that was. Uh, Madison Cortez, have... we can put you in touch. Yes, yeah, so if they want to come um, and talk in New Mexico once we can move around the world again, let's do it. Marvelous, marvelous. And I see another point here from Catherine Egan, and she wonders, have you done work on how the people she calls the Steve Bannons of the world, the Steve Bannons of the world, and it has been pointed out more than once that the previous president was surrounded by people with Irish names, surrounded by white I, men yeah. with Irish names. How they who have the world have no interest in admitting racial others into the ranks of the new Irish and new Americans of that matter. I suspect the answer to that question, Catherine, is that you do have an opinion on that. 
too. Catherine, I mean, I, I love that Catherine is here too because I've learned so much from her work. Um, I haven't worked specifically on that, but I've been around people who have done that work. Um, I think Mary Mullen has a lot to say on that. Um, on that count, I think Amy Kluke has a lot to say. There are people who are really looking at um, both very historic and very contemporary ways that um, that why that American conservatism is very much founded on this myth of, you know, Irish American exceptionalism and that bootstraps narrative. Yeah. Thank you very, very okay. much. And then one, one more, obviously, one thing that's been common through all these talks is obviously pandemic life, but how's it been for you? I mean, obviously, small yeah. child work, research, all of that, but also you were scheduled uh, last year, just as all this came into being, to deliver the, you know, the prize of the, um, keynote lecture at the American Commerce of Irish studies last year and you had to go and do it virtually. How How's the year been? I mean, I, I have nothing original to say about pandemic parenthood and working under these conditions and, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. It, it exacerbates every division that there already is and, um, you know, people are hustling everywhere and I admire people who are doing it while raising school age children in particular and caring for elders and stuff. Um, it's interesting because I so much associate the start of the pandemic with Irish studies. Um, you know, there were those couple of days in the US where everything happened and it happened so quickly. And um, so the ACIS conference was canceled, but also um, we at UNM were scheduled to host Paul Muldoon for a week long residency. We've been working on this forever. I was going to fly to Albuquerque and then go straight to Houston. And both of those things had to be canceled at the same time. And at the time I was at a symposium at Dartmouth hosted by UCD. There were maybe 15 of us or so. And you know, while we were here on this beautiful empty campus because it was spring break it's like the world changed and we sort of felt like the it's a terrible metaphor but like the people who are playing music on the titanic as, as it was sinking and i felt so much despair in the moment like this was the last bit of you know collegiality and and you know exchange of ideas that we were going to have for a very long time and i mean it's been true in terms of in person but it's been amazing how much stuff has been able to convert online. I mean, this, I've seen so much Irish theater over the past few weeks. And, you know, for anyone who doesn't live in one of the major metropolitan areas where Irish studies things happen, you look at those listservs and you see event after event go by and you're like, oh, I can't go to that. I can't see that. And it's been, I mean, it's, I, I don't have a lot of optimism about the moment, but that's been one of the upsides of this. And I hope it continues that we can continue, you know, bringing this kind of stuff to people who don't live in Boston or Dublin. And for a moment, believe that you're without optimism, Sarah. Everything about <laughs> you is optimistic indeed. And the future of Irish studies is optimist. Um, listen, uh, Mike, I, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Don't say something. And I want to say something about next week. Okay, I'll put my slide up so you can talk over it. Because um, next week, actually, um, we're, we're talking here about the influence of Ireland in the United States and, of course, around the world. And uh, we've spoken about it being very frequently about literature and about, um, um, uh, and about history, but so many other things. I want to say something just about film, indeed, because that's the thing that we're going to be speaking about next week. According to Variety magazine, Ireland has become a capital of filmmaking, establishing yourself as one of the world's most attractive production environments. And the effects of that can be found in your local cinema and indeed on your local, and in your own local television, in film and television, in animation. And I'm thinking about Cartoon Saloon. And if you haven't seen Wolf Wakers, then you should actually see it. Wolf Walkers, which is pretty, pretty marvellous. Um, but next week's guest is, of course, um, um, uh, Lenny Abrahamson, a uh, Dublin-born director who you might know perhaps from Adam and Paul from Garage, or Garage, I think is perhaps, I don't know how you're pronouncing it, but very particularly um, for normal people. And if you haven't seen normal people, Sally Rooney's the uh, dramatization, the film in, of Sally Rooney's magnificent novel, now is the time to do it. Lenny Abrahamson is going to talk to us about his own work about being a director, about being an Oscar nominee, about the influence of uh, Irish film around the world. And that's going to be at the same time and at the same place. And look forward to seeing everybody there. And thanks again to you all for coming. And thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Yes. yes.